into uh, HTTP tag in the past before. Okay, sweet. Not quite everyone, but a lot of people. So our basic format is uh, we have uh, five, or in this week's case, uh, four companies come up and uh, present about their company for five minutes, uh, do a pitch. Uh, then there's a community uh, Q&A for five minutes. Um, and so the, the whole idea is sort of twofold, uh, letting uh, uh, young up-and-coming companies uh, sort of sort of let the community know that they exist, uh, and then also uh, let people who have been part of the uh, startup community for a while grill those people on uh, business fundamentals, make sure that we're creating sustainable businesses and not just trying to flip our business to Facebook. Um, okay, let's see here. There's a whole bunch of announcements, uh, but I don't want to delay too much. Oh yeah, Sean, I guess you're up first. Uh, so if you wanna, if you wanna get set up, um, let's see here. Oh yeah, and thanks to our sponsors, uh, A2 Geeks, uh, is a sort of umbrella organization that puts on a lot of these cool startup events across uh, Ann Arbor. You can find out more at a2geeks.org. And thanks also to the uh, Zell Lurie Institute uh, for giving us uh, use of the space uh, for the entire year, actually. Okay, and so this is uh, Sean Simpson from uh, Autobike. How's it going, guys? Uh, I'm just going to walk you through a little bit about uh, my company, Autobike. We were uh, founded in January 2011. Um, started work on it then and sort of started picking up speed um, about August, September of uh, last year. Um, so far, we've been self funded and then uh, we've gotten some different loans to kind of help us keep going. Um, basically, think of our product as an automatic transmission for a car except put on a bicycle and kind of expand from there. So, the premise is that gear shifting is not for everyone. For a lot of uh, people that just want to get on and ride a bike, you know, it can be noisy and clunky, uh, especially shifting under load. Um, you know, changing gears often is kind of a, a reactionary occurrence. So you're riding along there, all of a sudden you're pedaling too fast or it's too hard to pedal and then you change gears. So you're sort of, um, you know, minimizing your dip discomfort versus what we think we're doing is maximizing your comfort. And um, it also has limited capabilities. I mean, our, our system, as I'll explain, can, can just do things that are just not possible to do with a manual transmission bike. So as far as the market goes, um, the U.S. bike market um, is huge, but it's subdivided into sort of bikes that you find at uh, like Walmart. Um, then the next step would be like the change sporting goods would be like this, REI, and then where we fall would be at more towards the special end, which doesn't account for as many of the units, but accounts for you know a large sum of the dollars. So people are paying more for differentiated bikes, not just let's go to like, you know Walmart and get whatever bike we can. So to, to attack it, we're going to start with um, going after you know bike segments that are most um, sort of in line with our technology, which is providing sort of this maximum comfort ride. So we're looking at kind of cruiser bikes, comfort bikes, um, you know people that not competition type riding, just people who want to get on a bike, you know, have fun, get from A to B. Um, how our product actually works is we're basically using an embedded controller that takes into um, account you know, a couple different sensors, pedal speed, rear hub speed, um, it's got an accelerometer on board and kind of defines the operating environment. So how are you riding, how fast are you going, uphill, downhill, figures out what the most appropriate gear ratio is and then using a CVT transmission actually allows you to stay within that perfect uh, gear ratio at all times. So you're literally, you know, you go on a ride for uh, you know a minute you might be in three or four hundred different distinct gear ratios throughout that entire ride, but not really feel any of those shifts. So um, I have the bike here, so we'll do a demo afterwards. I can zoom through that. Um, so basically, what does our thing do? It gets rid of noisy, uh, harsh, clunky shifts because um, we can shift under one we're using CVT, so each ratio step is so small that it's almost imperceptible. Um, you know, instead of having only 18 speeds, 21 speeds, where people might use three or four of those, we're using essentially an infinite number of gears between a range, and uh, it automatically selects that right gear. Um, so back in October 2001, we started with um, sort of this ugly looking um, bike that was like, can we you know, get this sort of ride that we want um, using off the shelf components? And then uh, we took that and said, okay, now, can we be using like an actual production intent system, so speed sensor stuff that you know we were using speed sensors that were four or five hundred dollars. Now we're using you know speed sensor that might be you know three or four dollars. So the Alpha Plus was like, can we cost effectively provide this ride? And then what um, what we've just finished up recently is a beta, which is can we take that sort of you see the kind of new packaging with the development controller and offset shifting system and make it into a clean looking bike so that the bike looks as simple as the bike is to ride, but you know has all this additional capability built in. Um, so here's just a couple of products we're going to have of the first two bikes that we're going to um, have for sale um, starting in September.
longer. Uh, there is some competition. Most of the competition right now is based on like manually um, or mechanically controlled automatic systems. So there's a Land Rider bike right now that sells uh, more than 100,000 units for the last seven, eight years. And that's, that's kind of been off the map in terms of um, you know, that bike shop. They literally just sell directly and they've been doing well, but they're, they really haven't changed anything. And it's only seven gears and um, you know, the ride is really harsh because literally it's a derailleur system that will automatically change gears at certain you know, operating points. And, have a warning and the ratios are significant enough that you know they're kind of shocking and, and, and really kind of clunky. Um, how we're going to actually try to reach the customer is not through like the typical um, sales channel which would be through selling to bike shops and whatnot. Um, we found that Land Rider is able to reach the you know the target customer that they want that's interested in the product and um, you know and actually get those people to buy directly versus going through a bike shop where you kind of have some agency problems at least with that type of product. Um, this just goes in a little bit. What we're trying to do is basically get as many components that already exist, um, minimize the parts that were designed that are custom to us, and then providing an entire bicycle to the customer. Um, starting, we're um, actually probably the next week or so, we're going to go to a bunch of different bike events and have 10 of our beta bicycles. we we'll get as many people on the bike because the riding experience is really the differentiating part of it, and really is, um, you know, it's awesome. And, and anyone who wants to ride afterwards, um, come see me. I'll, I'll just hang out in uh, one of the areas and then. I've got it uh, strapped for that in my car right now. Um, so I'll go into the team stuff, but um, basically where we're at right now is we're going to finish up our production design. We're going to raise money to, to buy about a thousand or so bikes, and then we're going to um, start selling them in September. So thanks for your time. So now we have five minutes of uh, Q and A. I have a bunch of questions myself, but um, I'm sure that you guys do too. So I guess we will start with Steve. Uh, what exactly was your patent for? Um, the patent is a system and method for controlling. So basically, using the subset of sensors that we're using, getting basically creating that operating environment to know uphill, downhill, and then using that information to determine the proper gear ratio. So it's, it's, it starts as a system and method. Yes, Matt. Okay. Yes. Two questions. One, how much weight does it add? And two. Um, as far as weight goes, um, it, it's a, a delta from like you take a, just a regular bike and then put the system on there. So you're taking out the railer shifters, that kind of stuff. Delta would be like one to two pounds. Um, we're looking at doing a bolt on. The problem is, um, you know, initially it's sort of this, we're going after this market that's like, you know, people that just want to get on a bike and ride it. Sort of we think selling a bolt on kit where they then have to have a wheel build. Um, there's just a lot of additional kind of steps that would need to be taken. Plus. Um, making everyone's bikes different, so having a bolt-on solution means you kind of have to have everything be real universal, and then it kind of loses that kind of clean look. So we're thinking about doing something like that in the future, but to start, we wanted just to have this super clean-looking bike that kind of represents the ride, you know, both in looks and in function. This question way over there. Yes. Uh, one is what's your price point? The second, is this for the casual rider or for performance rider or both? Um, it's, it's definitely for the casual recreational type rider. Um, uh, price point, we're looking between five and seven hundred dollars, depending on uh, different options that we have. Yes. Um, if the battery dies, does it not work at all, or does it? Does it still work in some ways? Um, we, we use a front hub um, dyno on it, so it's, it self charges, so you never have to worry about plugging in. And our beta bikes, you have to plug in because we don't have that you know, capability in it yet. But for the production bike, you just get on and ride it, it'll recharge itself. What happens if it does die? If the battery dies? Yeah. It, it's just an off the shelf type um, like RC battery pack, so you can just, if you killed it, the, you know, the regen stopped working and you ran it so little that you damaged the cells, you can just swap a new one in there and you know, go, on your, go on your way. It's well, like, like what if it dies right? like while you're riding it? I mean, um, you would just be in the same gear ratio that you're. That you ended in, so. It's not like the Tesla Roadster runs out of batteries and sprays. No, you can't break yeah. this control on this bike. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I, well, uh, all right, I guess I just want to hop into one question. I kind of want to hear about more, more about you and your team. Uh, so, who are you guys? Are you recent graduates? Are you mechanical engineers? Um, I'm a, a mechanical engineering background, one of the other guys is too. Um, then we have a professor from OU who's um, like doing all the embedded control stuff, uh, both from hardware and software side. Um, and then we've got uh, like a finance guy as well who just likes bikes and sort of is part of the group of so yeah, that's awesome. mostly engineers. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, that's more of a detailed question. Can you set the gates that you desire? Yeah, 
you can actually um, program it to do like, so if you have a specific cadence or um, as you ride, you might, going uphill, you might have a different cadence that you like. You can program all that stuff. So there's gonna be an easy way with the rail and controller, or there's actually a more complex way where we have Bluetooth capability on the bike where you can link up with your phone, use our app, and actually tailor that ride exactly how you want it. So it's as simple or as complex as the rider wants to make it. Yes? How are you sourcing parts, and how complicated is that? Um, that, that's probably one of the more complicated parts. Um, we, we had a lot of bike industry contacts. One of the uh, guys on our advisory board was a former president of Trek, or of uh, Giant and Schwinn. So he, um, he's, he's helped us out with a lot of sourcing for like the bicycle components. We're going to um, buy a lot of the components and then assemble um, in Michigan. So yeah, it's, um, some of the PCB and that kind of stuff, there's a lot of local stuff we can use, but for the actual bike frames, there's actually not a lot of high volume US um, bicycle builders. So. Um, that was, that's been a tough part. Um, there, there's actually more, there's one coming to Detroit right now that says they're gonna build 100 bikes uh, a day so that you know, there would be more options for local sourcing for the frames and stuff too. Current Motors certainly assembles their bowling frames here, here in Michigan, so I don't, I don't know if I guess it, that's, mm. that's a one day away from Right, so, yeah. High, a lot higher price point. <laughs> yeah, that's true, <laughs> that's very true. Uh, let's see here, okay, I have one more question for you. Yeah, so I'm really curious, um, it sounds like you guys have done a bunch of the engineering work and I cannot wait to ride the bike after this presentation. So then you touched a little bit on how you're going to uh, distribute these things. Um, so uh, it doesn't sound like you're going to channel parts you're sell it yourself. Do you have an mm -hmm. idea for like crazy marketing promotions or how are you going to get the word out there? To um, the we're gonna, we want to try to work with a lot of bicycle rental companies where we basically kind of give away bikes and that's like a good chance for people with no obligation to ride the bike. And since uh -huh. it is such a unique riding experience, I think it'll resonate and people will you know, tell their friends that thing. It's a lot like gorilla type marketing. Yeah, sounds awesome. All right, well, if we if you have questions afterwards, I think we'll all be sticking around. So thanks so much, Sean. Cool, thank you. There's actually way more community announcements than uh, usual. Um, so I guess now would be a good time to do that. Um, uh, are there any uh, area technology events that people want to announce or things that are relate to the startup community that uh, you want to share with everyone? No? All right, I have a bunch of them. Um, so people, do people know about the Lean Startup Conference that's going on in uh, Grand Rapids on Thursday? If you, if you are doing a web development uh, uh, company uh, and you're sort of unfamiliar with the idea of like Steve Blank, Lean Startup Circle, that sort of thing, you should really check out this conference. It's going to be awesome. Uh, they have, I believe they have Steve Blank coming. Um, they also have uh, Dan Martell, a couple other advisors from the Valley, to sort of discuss about how to um, quickly get your business off the ground, that sort of thing. That's this Thursday, you can Google it. Um, also coming There are up, limited tickets, though, so it's yeah. entirely possible they're sold out. Tickets are 125. They weren't sold out last time I checked for the one day pass. They might be now. There's a bus going from Ann Arbor to Grand Rapids as well. Yeah, and there's a workshop on Friday. That's probably those are sold out. Those are yeah. all sold out already. I think the conference itself might sell tickets though. Um, other things to check out: the Ann Arbor Mini Maker Fair um, is coming up uh, Saturday, uh, June second. It is probably one of the highlight events for me uh, in Ann Arbor. Basically, all the makers um, that uh, live in Ann Arbor come out and show people what they've been working on. It's a great event for uh, families. There's also stuff for kids to do that sort of thing. Uh, let's see here. Any other really important things? I got one. Oh yeah, go for it. All right, if, uh, if Lean Startup Conference or going to Grand Rapids isn't your thing Thursday, um, there is a group called Grow Detroit, and it's basically like a grassroots collective of web startup entrepreneurs, and um, they're having an event in Detroit on Thursday that's free to come, and I think Thursday's event is basically gonna be a show up and drink beer and talk event. Usually we have like someone presenting or something, but Google Grow Detroit if you're interested in that. Yeah, and also I know that it's advertised on the Hackers and Hustlers Facebook group, which is a great way to connect with all the other entrepreneurs that are not just in uh, Michigan, but also uh, East Lansing, uh, Detroit, uh, even I think like Plymouth and Livonia and stuff like that. Okay, so I've uh, delayed long enough. Um, up next is uh, Search GSA, and presenting is uh, David and Guitaro. How's everybody doing tonight? Woo. Appreciate y'all coming out tonight. It's uh, you know, a little bit late. I know you're probably all waiting on dinner, so we won't uh, take too much of your time. Uh, my name is David Hardcastle. This is Kintaro Roy. Um, Kintaro and I are actually about 14 months into a uh, startup web marketing firm. Uh, we do search engine optimization and website design, along with some other things. 
Um, and, and what I'm actually going to go do is tell you a little bit about where Search GSA come from, uh, because it actually came out of some of our, uh, our work with our marketing firm that we run together. Uh, so the idea originated when we were, as a web marketing firm, as many of you may know, there are, there are a lot of us out there. And so you know, we're always looking uh, for new ways to kind of separate ourselves from, from other web marketing firms. And so we've been searching for uh, new markets to enter that, that don't have the penetration that, that some of the local markets do in terms of our business. Um, and so one of the things we were able to do uh, is actually had this idea of searching through and, and looking for uh, contractors who work for the government. Um, and so as, as a way to do that, we actually started using a, a website called uh, GS, or GSA Advantage, uh, which is a government-run website. Uh, it's basically if you are a private contractor and you have a price list to try to get work uh, from the government, you're able to post your list on there. Um, and then uh, you know, government, or government agencies who need to hire you should be able to find you. And so we were trying to use that public database to find companies uh, with similar interests to some of the companies we work for in our current markets uh, to get into. And, and what we found out is that that uh, GSA Advantage site was, was really poor. Uh, we weren't able to find anything on there that we really wanted to. We had a really bad experience. Uh, and as we started doing a little bit more research, we discovered very quickly that uh, this is a very common problem and this is a need that wasn't being met. This, this quarter billion dollar government website, surprise, surprise, wasn't efficient at, at connecting the people that needed to be connected. Um, and so what we did is we built our own custom search engine using Google tools uh, to, to access that public database and, and to be able to do those searching much more efficiently and to make those connections. Uh, so I'm going to let Katara say a little bit about what that is. So, uh, so like David said, GSA Advantage uh, was a quarter billion dollar website and the primary use for this site is the uh, search functionality. So if you're an acquisition worker working for the federal government, uh, primarily uh, for the GSA, which handles most of the acquisitions, uh, you go to GSA Advantage and you would type in what you want. Uh, a very common search that these acquisition workers make is a service uh, or product in an estate because if, I, uh, if, if a uh, military base in uh, Virginia is looking for electrical engineers, then uh, as a government uh, contracting officer, I would go to GSA Advantage and say, okay, I need an electrical engineer in Virginia. Uh, we performed this search um, and the first result that we got was a subscription company for like magazines and things like that, and they're actually based in North Carolina. So, uh, this is kind of an example of the kind of results that GSA Advantage returns uh, based on the queries that you're entering. Uh, on our tool that we built, Search GSA, which is a free tool that's powered by Google Technology, uh, if you search for Electrical Engineer in Virginia, all the results that are displayed are highly relevant, uh, primarily because, primarily because uh, the whole querying and results displaying processes uh, using Google Technology. Um, <coughs> The value in this uh, naturally is to the users uh, that work for the federal government, uh, primarily uh, contracting specialists at the General Services Administration. Uh, however, there is also a very big benefit to taxpayers. Um, we did some math, and the sources for this is available at uh, searchgsa.com slash about, but uh, we estimated that at least $126 million every year is spent by government workers searching for uh, government contractors in search G or GSA Advantage. Uh, if we took all of those contracting specialists and moved them to Search GSA, then we basically make everyone work 10 times more efficiently, so the, uh, the taxpayer money savings ends up being uh, over $110 million per year. Uh, again, the, uh, here's some of the data that we uh, pulled. This is all uh, data that the uh, GSA had published. Uh, and again, uh, more details available at searchgsa.com slash about. Basically what we're doing is, is we're trying, this is kind of an offshoot to our main business, uh, what, what pays the bills, but we're looking at uh, ways to really grow the user base. We want to get more and more uh, government workers to be able to find out about this. Um, so some of the things we're doing is we're trying to create some brand recognition for the product using social media, which has been, uh, through the first two weeks, has been pretty successful, I'd say, based on our analytics. Uh, we're also looking at trying to reach out to local and, and national level politicians to see if they can create some awareness for this using our PR firm. Uh, and we're also looking at opportunities where we might be able to get this directly in front of GSA and federal government employees. Um, but really what we're here tonight for, and, and we want to come to you guys and ask a question is, you know, is this an idea that's, we, we think it's a good idea, but we're not sure. We wanted to reach out to you and, and kind of see what you thought and, and maybe if you had ideas on, on how to create more awareness for this, how to help us build that user base. Um, and at that point, we're ready to turn it over to questions. I think uh, one back in your what is the value slide, uh, one thing you want to be aware of, you live with the numbers. 
but pay attention to how the numbers line up. Because if you have 16 million to the left of 126 million, the casual observer not paying attention is going to go, oh, it's only like 10 million. Um, make sure the numbers line up so you can see. Or use something simple like a visualization, a simple pie chart so you can see the magnitude of it. Because part of what you're doing is, right now is trying to sell the value. You need to make it clear and quick to see. We actually have a nice infographic. We weren't sure of the presentation style before we got here tonight. Otherwise, we'd probably use our infographic, which is, is very visual in terms of helping show that. But yeah, that's great for the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, so your study uh, estimates uh, how much time savings the government employs. Does it also measure if they notice? Sorry, I mean, is, this, is this real to them? I, I'm sorry, uh, if they notice? That they're saving the time. I mean, so with search does, GSA, really, does that really impact their, their lives, their, their work? A, a lot of employees, it's only job in the federal government is to be a contracting specialist and to source these uh, suppliers that are in the private sector for government projects. So uh, for those employees, yes, it would make a, a very large impact. There are some other employees that uh, you know use uh, GSA Advantage on and off. I mean, so th there's a wide range of employees that this would uh, certainly save a lot of time with. Uh, but uh, primarily, it would uh, make a large impact with the contracting specialists that actually do all the sourcing all day long. The, the other thing we know that, that there is some real uh, reality to this is that there's a, there's another government website where, where uh, agencies are able to post wanted ads when they get fed up with, with GSA Advantage and they want to just say, hey, look, this is what I need. Somebody come find me. Um, so there's, there's what, 1,200 of those a month that are posted by government employees. Um, so we, that, that was one of the things that helped to identify this is, hey, look, this is, a, this is something that isn't performing the way it is because of those wanted ads. Uh, and I think that's kind of helpful in that way, too. Yes, back home. How many GSA acquisition specialists did you talk to in order to uh, we have, um, so actually on, on Search GSA, uh, we have created some refinements to help make the searching process easier. Uh, we've uh, talked to at least, uh, at least a dozen uh, contracting specialists at the GSA to help you know, make sure that this product is going to be as useful as possible uh, for those employees. They're involved with the design of the, of the search tool. Uh, yes, in the yellow. Um, are there GSA contractor trade shows? Uh, we think so. That, that's one of the things we're actually uh, working kinda, to. Kind of uh, going from the other direction. Uh -huh. you know, find the people that are already contracting because they already know a GSA placement specialist because they're the person that called them, right? That might be a way too, you know, from every angle. Thank you, yes. Um, and actually all the information for the contracting specialist is public data, so uh, we, we have considered uh, you know, reaching out to these people when they post a wanted ad for a service they couldn't find on GSA Advantage, saying, hey, you know, we found this company that you couldn't find on you know, GSA Advantage, here's the information needed, and here's our website that helped us find it for you. Uh, so that, that's certainly an uh, avenue we were looking at. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you make money? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, we would make the commercial model for this is, I mean, first we naturally need to build a user base. Um, and from there we, we would have the option to either, you know, sell advertisement space on the website or to promote specific results. Uh, for example, if, uh, if Boeing wanted to show up, you know, very well for specific searches that are performed on the search engine, then they may have the opportunity to show up very well on the search results. We're able to have an AdWords style advertising right, right on the, the Google search tool. That's one other way. So, uh, yes, in the blue. Uh, formal recognition. Um, a lot of government agencies are required to use specific GSA type applications and services. What do you do to get approved on that on that access? Can you pursue? Uh, I'm sorry. What do we do to? In order to be approved, a lot of a lot of agencies are going to be required to go specifically to GSA Advantage. Period. Yeah. Uh, and block you. How do you get the approval? For them to use you and stuff. Uh, so, from the research that we've uh, done and the people that we've talked to that are contracting specialists, uh, there are some other external to tools that have existed in the past and no longer exist, which are similar to what this search engine does. Uh, it doesn't have the same kind of capabilities that this does, but I mean, it, you know, you can actually go to Google.com and try to search for prices within a specific, specific site. So, there are a lot of um, contracting specialists that, specialists that have already used external tools, um, and uh, through the <coughs> Through the specialists that we know that, are, that do the contracting work, uh, we have gotten uh, a good number of users already to this site, so uh, we're, we're pretty confident that uh, there isn't any kind of uh, 
uh, issue as far as uh, you know legal. Well, the, yeah, the, the, other thing, tool. the other thing is too is that's why we're considering the political route too is, is actually getting people uh, within the government to try to get you know to, especially with an election year maybe you can kind of capitalize on that uh, and, and that's kind of why we kind of ran the, the taxpayer angle with some of our PR uh, to see if that can get kind of picked up and, and kind of run with by, uh, by from the political angle as well uh, to kind of have it uh, maybe initiated from within. Uh, as, as, as it's one of the ideas we're bouncing around. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Okay, so far we've had uh, people who are uh, uh, building a new method of transport and people talking about government contracts. I think we're about to combine uh, both of them with the sky You guys want to come get set up? Um, uh, while they're getting set up, uh, next next month for ACU Tech, we're considering doing a slightly different format where instead of having uh, individual companies come up and uh, do their pitch, we're thinking about getting a panel of four or five experts on a particular topic to answer the audience questions and also have a, a moderator ask them specific questions. Uh, something surrounding startups, we're thinking about maybe talking about how to uh, price your application or price your software or maybe uh, something on like how to do marketing or how to do uh, distribution channels. Are any of those topics in particular of interest to people in this crowd? Or do you have suggestions for, for other topics you'd like to see? I guess hands for pricing. Who'd like to hear more about how startups uh, price their product? Okay, small handful. Uh, what about uh, marketing, getting people to know about your product? Who'd like to hear more about that sort of thing? All right, both those things sound interesting. I don't know that there's a clear winner. Uh, please, uh, after uh, all the presentations, if you have other ideas, uh, come let me know. Um, okay, and so up next is uh, Sky Specs. I believe we have uh, Danny and I'm Tom. Tom. Okay, sweet. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Good, e good evening, everyone. Uh, we are Sky Specs. Uh, my name is Danny Ellis, and this is Tom Brady. And uh, we are two students here at the University of Michigan. And unlike uh, some of the people who've already presented, we are actually just recently founded about six weeks ago. So we are a very uh, young company. And our goal is to advance UAV technology in the civilian market. Um, UAVs are typically known in military, uh, but we're trying to bring that to the civilian realm, and we feel there are a lot of applications. Uh, starting here, uh, law enforcement, surveillance, uh, aerial photography, disaster relief, and structural inspection. And uh, we want to attack the structural inspection side of things. So you may know about the Minneapolis bridge collapse that happened back in 2007. So taking a look at these pictures here, this bridge had not been inspected in 15 months. Primarily because the cost of it is too high, they couldn't do it frequently because of that, and it's just very dangerous to put people under the bridge and kind of block traffic and, and do all of that. And uh, the failure that you see here, it's kind of hard to see in this picture on the projector, but the gussets were physically buckled, and it was very easy to see in the inspection after the, the collapse. Had this been seen earlier, this may have been prevented, and uh, if, if we could provide a way to do inspections more frequently, this might be possible. Other customers that we've been talking to, Michigan Department of Transportation, I spoke with them last night actually with the administrator of all bridge inspections in Michigan. And uh, they were basically saying that inspections are entire, entirely too costly right now and they're not getting the data that they want. Uh, you may not believe it, but all they do is they put a person in a bucket, go below the bridge, take some pictures with a camera. What we want to do is we want to do a much wider range of data acquisition to provide the inspectors with a way to look at stuff much closer, much fre more frequent, and be able to prevent any sort of failure uh, long before it happens. Other customers we're looking at are Disney World. Uh, we've spoken with them. We're actually going down there in three weeks to meet with them to do full model reconstruction of all of their attractions for both safety and renovation purposes. And we've spoken with firms in the state of Ohio for any sort of sewer inspection. Um, our vehicle is actually designed to fly in tight spaces, and we want to be able to fly full lengths of sewers and do a full model reconstruction of the sewer systems to uh, look for failures there, as opposed to sending a person walking down through the sewer taking pictures. So what we're going to look at here, structural inspection, it's incredibly dangerous, uh, especially in areas of uh, way high up in a cherry picker or hanging over a bridge. And there have been recent deaths, uh, most recently from my knowledge here in uh, Brown, Michigan, is off the Ambassador Bridge going to Canada. Uh, they had an inspector fall there and, and he died. And so we want to try to prevent these dangers. It's also very costly, doesn't happen very frequently, it's a public inconvenience, incredibly time consuming, and the quality is just very low. It's uh, pretty much an engineer writing down something and taking some snapshots. 
and they don't really keep track of that over time. There are a lot of things that were noticed years ago that got forgot about. We want to be able to provide data that you can easily look at over time. So what we want to do is develop a small UAV, which Tom is holding here. It does fly. We will not be flying it tonight, uh, unfortunately, but it does fly. And uh, we want to make it lightweight and modular and carry pretty much any sensor that you want. On the right here is a full 3D reconstruction that we're showing, and we want to provide data like this in addition to full HD video and any other sensors that inspectors want on all of the different infrastructure and be able to compare it over time and look at it uh, and kind of see the macroscopic changes tied along with a lot of the microscopic changes um, with other sensor packages that we will put on board. The benefits of this is it's much safer, much easier to do, it's half the price of the current method, if not cheaper, once we uh, perfect it. We can increase the inspection frequency from once every 15 months, once every 18 months, to once a month or once every three months and, and look at stuff a, a lot closer. We can have higher quality data, we can have versatile sensor options, and it is not obstructive to the everyday life. Uh, we spoke with someone today that was actually doing uh, inspections of the bridge at the Detroit Metro Airport. Uh, the bridge that the planes taxi over as you're driving into the airport. They had could only work Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they had to shut down half the lanes in order to do their inspection up underside the bridge. With this, you would not have to shut down the lanes. You could work seven days a week, perform that inspection as necessary, and not cause a hassle to people that are already you know, hassled by going to the airport to begin with. So our team is originated from the Michigan Autonomous Aerial Vehicle Team, a little bit of background on us. Tom and I founded this team as a student competition team about three years ago. This vehicle in Tom's hand is designed to go to the International Aero Robotics Competition this uh, July and August and, and compete there. We have assembled the core of this team and uh, grown into SkySpecs and uh, we'll still want that team to uh, you know, stay at the university. It's, it's going to be two separate entities, but we will be using similar technology that we have developed here at the university to go perform uh, these structural inspections and uh, whatever other civilian UAV market you know, may come about after that. So uh, real quick, uh, like I said, my name is Danny. My background is, uh, material, is a master's in aerospace and robotics and uh, kind of systems engineering. Tom's background, also aerospace and robotics, and he focuses on controls. And our third member who's in Chicago right now is uh, Sam, and he's an electrical engineer, PhD. And uh, so these are the three founding members, but we do have a core group of engineers that are working below us uh, kind of as interns right now because they are uh, still students, uh, but we're going to grow from there. Um, so real quick, uh, what's next? Look at advanced technology, do on-site demonstrations, uh, build a customer base, and we're uh, looking to acquire a little bit more funding through grants, uh, angel investors, and, and the like like that. So anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, we are Sky Specs. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so um, I was going to get into that last slide, we kind of ran out of time here. The business model uh, in the phase one of what we're calling it is to actually sell a service and uh, kind of go and do the inspection and collect the data and provide them with the data. We do not want to be in the position to certify it, but we do want to be providing the data, um, especially because this is handmade right now and we have not geared towards mass production. Uh, but phase one is that. Tom, you want to talk about the next phases? Uh, Phase two would be selling both the product and the license. Um, we would basically sell this product to companies that are already doing structural inspections, and they would use our software to provide a better inspection that is more efficient and more cost effective for their clientele. What kind of uh, fly time do you have with the vehicle? Obviously, it's arbitrary to the weight or the right. sensors that you have. And also, would it just be still pics, or would it be streaming video? Uh, would it be, you know, uh, Bluetooth to your laptop? That you right, so up? our first the flight time. This vehicle, as seen, is only 10 minutes, but that's because the competition is 10 minutes long. Uh, the lift capacity of this, we could put more batteries on, get about 40 minutes of flight out of this one. And the core of this, um, it can stay the same. We can put bigger propellers on, get about an hour and a half flight. Uh, with Instead of 9-inch propellers, about 12-inch propellers. So the flight time is, is variable. Um, as for the, the imaging, uh, we want to have a full streaming, low res coming down to like a tablet. Uh, we have already built an Android tablet that will fly this and interact with it. And uh, streaming high def is, is very costly, but we do want to stream a low res and store the high res footage on an SD card on board to be downlinked later. Um, but it is it, it's designed to be very easy to fly, and uh, the interaction will be like, you know, go forward. 
And when you let go, it loiters. And if you tell it to go forward into a wall, it'll stop and it won't run into that wall. Uh, you know, so it's very intuitive, very simple. You don't need to be an RC pilot in order to fly this. Yeah, I don't know how the, how the market for the inspections works like this, but have you considered um, doing things like a, like a subscription for a, you know, some kind of key metrics to depend on, on the type of structure so you could develop some competencies and you know, maybe the types of sensors that could sense key things on the structures and then also like a, uh, you know, some interface for someone who is in charge of maintenance that can just look and see out the, the whole history. What's important about what we're trying to provide is that we are providing a system that is modular and scalable. So this, along with the software package, should work with ideally any sensor that you want. If you want 3D laser rangefinders, we got that covered. If you want vision, we got that covered. Um, I think we're looking into right now uh, ultrasonic depth finding, um, such as if I walk past a wall of concrete, is it three feet over three feet thick here? Is it four feet thick over here? That's the kind of thing that's especially interesting for um, sewers and bridges. Um, so we haven't, I guess that's a good point, we haven't looked into a subscription model. Um, or just like, have you talked to like the people who are in charge of ma maintaining these things and you know how, how they're paying for that maintenance, I guess? Yeah, right now most of what they're doing is entirely visual. Um, which they, they themselves say, you know, the, the guy we talked to today, he's like, yeah, they just go around and kind of tap on it and they're like, oh yeah, it looks good. And, and they really don't have any data over time. And uh, they, the data they have is really just what the inspector himself sees on site. And uh, right now there's a lot of failures. A lot of them are not disasters, but they're all small failures just because one inspector saw one thing and one did not. And uh, we'd like to provide that footage so, you know, you could just have it there and any inspector could look at it, any engineer can pull it up. Um, kind of tailored around that. Have you looked into emergency response teams and disaster response Yes, teams? absolutely. Um, our, our kind of one of our later phases is we want to have an emergency response team for such things as like the tsunami in Japan. Uh, this is something that could easily be deployed into a disaster zone like that with radiation, where this isn't going to be affected with radiation like a human would be. That's actually the direction I was going if yeah. the environments are too dangerous for a person. Right. So those people would really be. Right, absolutely. In addition to that, one of the things that we want to be able to carry, this is much later than our first phase, um, is be able to have this be a mobile cell tower. So in disasters like Katrina, you can immediately deploy this while it's doing search and rescue. It's also taking in phone calls while people that are down there are trying to call out. And uh, it will provide that communication back to you. Two words, fuel cell. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think we have time for one more question. One more question? Um, how disposable is it if you want to send this into a fire? Uh, can you have three or four if one of them, two of them gets consumed? Yeah, so we want to have multiple levels of them. This one right here is about $10,000, but it's primarily in the two lasers that you see on there. Take those lasers away, it's about $2,500 for the rest of the system, and we're working to bring that down. Most of that is in the tiny inertial measurement unit. Uh, it's actually the same inertial measurement unit you put on like a Black Hawk helicopter. Uh, but we're actually working with uh, some people here. Their, their research is to bring that much cheaper from about $2,000 to about $300. Um, so at some point, we do want to have them fully disposable. So if you do lose one, it's not a big deal. Great. Thank you, so, guys. All right. Thank you very much. I hope we can stick around. It sounds like there might be some. Uh, yeah, we, we'll be here afterwards. Okay, great. Will there be a uh, flight demo? or? Uh, not today, unfortunately. One day. All right. See you Okay, is Kyle Wilka here? There's two reasons why I need to find Kyle Wilka. I don't think he is though. I know the company he's working for, AppKey, has just launched. No, okay, so the two reasons I need to find Kyle Wilka is one, because he helped plan the A2 New Tech uh, after party. So uh, after Steve's presentation, I think people are going to be hanging on a little bit, uh, asking questions, that sort of thing. But then at uh, 7.30, I believe, we have a reservation at uh, Dominic's. So for those of you who want to continue enjoying the fine weather and uh, try their uh, world famous sangria and constant buzz, uh, afterwards I think a lot of us are going to be uh, headed over there for dinner and drinks. Uh, the second reason I would need to find Kyle Mulka is because um, I believe that uh, Steve has tied him for the, with his presentation tonight for the most h Tech presentations. They have both, this is Steve's fourth presentation and I think Kyle has also done uh, uh, four presentations. Uh, let's see here. I just want to run through, make sure I announce everything. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. I so, texted him, by the way. He said he lost count. So he's not oh, sure. okay, okay, okay. Well, we'll get the official count later. Okay, so please welcome Steve Schwartz from Alpha Django. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, 
Hi, I'm Steve Schwartz, and the company I'm presenting is Alpha Django, which is sort of a meta startup. This is going to be a very experimental presentation, by the way. This is an HTML5 uh, presentation in the browser. I decided to give it a try and see what happens. So no guarantees that it actually displays properly. But anyway, my company is Alpha Django. We're sort of a meta startup. Um, Alpha Django builds web-based startups. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, basically, it means that we are the CTO and development team for startups that need it. Um, so let's say uh, you've been in, an, you're well entrenched in an industry, you have an awesome idea, you have the connections, you're a good salesperson, you know it can be successful, you just happen not to be a technical person or you don't have a lot of technical contacts. So what do you do? Is it better to spend the next 12 months trying to find a technical co-founder or what if in that 12 months uh, you could have hired us to just build it for you and it's making money within those 12 months. Um, I'm actually not saying that one is better than the other, just that it's kind of a gray area that we decided to explore. Um, Alpha Django actually started out as a normal software consultancy, so you would hire us and we would build your software. You know, there's a million of those, it's not rocket science, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I've done a few startups in the past, and through doing those startups, I built a pretty good network of developers and designers and, and business people, and I got a lot of experience uh, in doing those startups and, and doing the marketing and the market research and talking to customers and refining startups, doing you know things like lean startup methodology and agile and all that good stuff. Um, and I found that these uh, teams I had built and this experience I had amassed could actually be leveraged and used to help other people build their startups. Um, I actually unintentionally at one point realized that all the clients I had had over the past year and a half were all startups and I didn't even mean to do that. Um, so I said, hey, there's something to this. And I started to realize that uh, there were certain things I was doing that was not like what a normal software consultancy does. Um, for one thing, software consultancies focus on this sort of uh, process. They, you know, have a discovery phase. They spec out the software, and then they build it according to spec. It actually doesn't really go too well for startups because the startups, a lot of times, that spec is going to change a hundred times a day. Um, and also, the other thing about startups is that um, they actually need uh, a lot of help and support in this fourth step, the refinement stage. And this is typically where software consultancies go away and yet it's where startups need the most help. So what Alpha Django does is it focuses on getting the startups to that last refinement stage, or to that last stage as quickly as possible so that they can refine. We get their minimum viable product built and launched and in front of customers so that we can actually help them talk to customers and figure out what it is they actually want and what they'll pay for. Um, so what does it take in the current ecosystem to actually build a successful startup? Well, now, I mean, the, since the cost of development and building a startup has gone down, the standards have gone up. You now, to actually be able to have a successful startup, you pretty much need to go ahead and build a prototype, gain traction, then start generating revenue or raise funding, um, and then scale up. And so when you're not a technical person, it's basically impossible to do steps one, two, and three. So that's basically where we come in, and we focus on helping the startup with those first three steps so that they can actually scale up. So this is a case in point. Um, Nick Gordon had an, had an idea for a mobile app that would connect car dealerships with customers off hours, but he had no one to build it. In January last year, he found us. In Feb by February, we had an MVP all fleshed out and figured out what we were going to build and launch. By May, we actually had it launched. By August, it was generating money, um, and we had actually already begun work on version two, so by August, we launched version, version two. And as of today, uh, CarCode has actually launched and deployed at over 100 dealers nationwide. A lot of them are centered around Seattle and Portland because that's where Nick lives. Um, and it's doing great. It's actually making lots of money and, and growing. And just over a year ago, it was just an idea. So um, that's just one story. We actually have other starts of car codes one. Crowd Juice actually Ed is in the audience here with Crowd Juice, and we just uh, launched Crowd Juice with our first uh, conference today in Ypsilanti, uh, the Michigan Growth Capital Symposium. Um, Great Master Rental, Fans Helping Artists is another, so Great Master Rental is uh, actually one of my first startups. Fans Helping Artists is another local startup. Lee was another was my other, my second startup. 
uh, car firm, Scout Force, Vicky Cast, which is a white combinator company, and we're looking to keep going. And then there are other slides, but they're not as important. We do a lot of open source development. Easy. Those are key. Yay. Questions? Thank you, Steve. Um, that's a really good question, and it actually depends on what you mean by scale. If you mean scale my business, I can tell you that. If you mean scale the startups, there's an entirely different answer to that. Scale your um, So for scaling my business, uh, it's very difficult to scale. Um, and I'm actually not looking to scale it too much. Uh, ideally, right now, we have three people, including myself. Ideally, I wouldn't want to have more than maybe five or six people, um, because my goal is to basically build a really kick-ass development team that are the best at what we do, and, uh, and then be able to provide a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. So I think instead of scaling, what we'll do is as demand gets greater and greater, we'll just have to get more and more selective with who the startups are that we partner with. Um, and I, I can go ahead and answer, actually, I was, uh, let's pretend you also meant scaling the startups we work with. Um, and the answer to that is that we actually don't. We're really good at the really early stage stuff, fleshing out the MVP, getting it built, launch, maybe doing a version two or version three, building the revenue. Uh, when they get to the point where they're ready for you know, hockey stick kind of growth, we would actually use our connections to build them a dedicated full-time team. And we actually also have, you know, I have a lot of connections with venture capitalists and angel investors, and I could connect them with them as well to get funding if they needed it. Yes? Sometimes. Um, it really depends. Uh, if we took equity, usually what we do is we start out on a contract basis and then with some of the startups, if we work really well with them and we really like them and we, you know, we're right in there with the vision and, and, and helping them build the startup, then we do at that point sometimes offer a, uh, an equity stake for drastically reduced rates. Um, and so we do that for some startups. I would actually, I would love to be able to do it for all the startups we work with. I would even love to be able to work on the startups only for equity. Um, but, you know, I don't really have money, so we're not doing that yet. Just another question. Who do you see as your competition? Um, it's a good question. I don't really think about it. Uh, I'm sure there's like, probably Pivotal would be a, a Pivotal uh, Labs who built Pivotal Tracker and did a lot of pioneering work with the like Agile methodology and Scrum and, and all of that would probably be an example. Um, there's a few others. One of the issues is you could see almost any software consultancy as a competitor, but one of the things that we do differently is that with normal software consultancies, what we're doing is almost exactly opposed uh, to what a software consultancy does, and that a software consultancy is trying to get billable hours. They're trying to maximize their profits by getting as many billable hours as they can. Um, whereas with me, since I'm acting as a lot of these startups CTO, it's actually my job to connect their vision with the development and help them figure out ways to avoid giving me money. So I actually spend half my day uh, talking to clients and showing them how they can avoid giving me money. They'll be like, hey, we got 10 grand, we want to build this feature. And I'll look at it and I'll go, no, you know, that's a waste of money. Let's build this thing instead. It'll cost like 1500 We'll have it done in like four days and you can see if anyone actually wants this. And so that's what I spend half my day doing. And that's um, sort of where the equity versus money split comes because you're, exactly. you're helping them save money and then you're sort of allowing your interest to be successful as opposed to being billable. Exactly. Hours. We're way more interested in the long-term success of all the startups we work with rather than our you know, own short-term success in like increasing billable hours, which you know, could be a problem because the more billable hours we have from this startup, it could actually negatively impact their ability to grow and succeed. So, so um, I'm really fascinated by this like transition point where it um, helps a company get a V1, V2 of their product out, uh, and then they're sort of, uh, they're going into the VC roadshow, road show, they're going to raise a round. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you had that transition yet where you sort of cut ties with someone and sort of just let them loose now with their own development team? And That's a good question. We're actually not yet. We're really close with a couple. So like car codes, for instance, it's, um, I'd actually tell you how much, except it's being videoed, but it's making lots of money right now. <laughs> and we're, um, <coughs> We're actually kind of on the verge of like, we're still doing really well with it, but it's entirely foreseeable that within the next year we might have to do that transition. Um, 
We haven't yet. We've actually also come on board to a couple startups after they were already funded. So like one of the companies we're partnered that we're uh, you know partnered with and taking equity in is a Y Combinator startup. They they finished Y Combinator last year, and um, so they have like institutional investors like Y Combinator and the startup fund and and a bunch of other angel investors. And they actually brought us on board after the fact because they had a technical co-founder who, um, after they had to pivot a couple times, a technical co-founder, there was nothing, there was very little that was technically interesting about the project after they had to pivot to follow the money, basically. Um, and that founder got a really good job somewhere making like 300 grand a year, so they left. Uh, and so then they went to a software consultancy and then figured out basically what I explained, that the goals don't really align and that doesn't usually work out well. And then they came to us and have been really happy. So we're actually coming on board with them after the initial stage, but still before that, and after the institutional investment, but before they need to scale up and have a full-time team. So that's another interesting one where I'm not really sure how long we'll need to be on board. Ideally, it won't be long, because the longer we're on board, that means the longer it's been that they didn't you know, have that hockey stick growth and need a dedicated team. So I think we have time for one more question. Can you give us an idea of the range of costs of those projects that you do? Yeah, actually, I can tell you, this is something that's really interesting because I have spec'd out a lot of startups. I've helped a lot of people, basically. I have a lot of people who come to me with, you know, $180,000 pieces of software they want built. Of course, they don't know that's how much it costs to build something like what they have, but you know, they'll come to me with 50 page specs or 100 page specs, and I'm like, yeah, that's what it's gonna cost to build that if you were to just pay me. Um, but I actually, I don't like building things that big, especially when you're a startup, because if you have something spec'd out that, that, that's that big of a project, you're doing it wrong. Um, you need to get something small and launched and out there making money, and you need to be getting user feedback. Uh, so one of the interesting things about that, and this is like totally coincidence, I never would have expected this, but out of all the startups I've helped, you know, figure out the MVP and help them spec out and figure out no matter what the startup was doing or what kind of technologies they're interfacing with or, or, or whatever, almost every single one of them has been somewhere in the range of like 20 to 40K for an MVP. Um, some of them have been smaller and more in the range of like a 15K. Usually less than that, it's not really neat. It's usually nothing more than a CMS if it's less than that, so it's probably not a great MVP startup idea. Unless you already have people paying you for that, at in which point that would be awesome. But And usually if it's more than that, it's too spec'd out and too much to build for an MVP. So it almost always comes to the, like the 20 to 40K range, and usually it's closer to the 20 to 25 the majority of the time. There you go, that's how much you need to start a company. Thank you so much, Steve. Before we break, I just wanted to check one last time because of the community announcements. Otherwise, we'll see you guys soon at Dominic's. Yes. Sorry, I joined late, but uh, my name is Mike, and I wanted to announce to the group that there's a new program called Develop Detroit that's uh, just coming out. It's actually going to be hosting our first class in June, but the idea is. It's a 12-week program that you sign up for, similar to Code Academy in Chicago, but only we're focused on iOS apps. Uh, it'll be taught by some folks here in Ann Arbor, like Dave Kozil and Chris Adamson and, and Tom Crawford. But we'll be hosting it downtown it's in partnership with the uh, Dan Gilbert World, Detroit Venture Partners, and Resident Ventures is involved too. So anyone who's interested and would like to learn how to program an iPhone app or an iPad app, check out devdebt.com and hopefully by the end of the summer you can build a prototype. Awesome. Yeah, that, that D -D -B -D -D -D. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks you guys.